On today's World Insights, vote of confidence with a big turnout at the 2020 China International Fair for Trade in Services or SIFTIS, the nation's post-pandemic boom and prognosis, the words of the United Nations resident coordinator in China. As we can see from the case of China, countries would eventually come out of this crisis. The world will come out of this crisis. And a national tribute to heroes in China's battle against the COVID-19 pandemic. President Xi Jinping, he mentioned uh, one word uh, is, which impressed me very much. He said, we should take the, the people's health and safety to the first priority. Here's our host, Tian Wei. Hello and welcome to World Inside. I'm Tian Wei. Today, we are wading deeper into the first major international economic and trade event held by China since the COVID-19 outbreak, the 2020 China International Fair for Trade in Services. On its fifth day, the big and steady turnout at this event has sparked hope and some confidence. Last Saturday, the first full day of the exhibition, a total of 95,000 visitors were at the event, with only 60,000 allowed into the venue at any given time, in keeping with social distancing rules. The fair comes as China's economy has largely restarted, despite the devastating blow to many industries from a months-long shutdown. The good news is that China has gone weeks without reporting any new locally transmitted COVID-19 cases. So how well did China deal with this health crisis and how can we turn to our normal lives? Earlier, on the sideline of the fair, I asked Dr. Babatun Dea Hongzi, the UN resident coordinator in China, for his insights. Tell me more about not long after China struggled against the pandemic, and finally we have such a mega scale event today. What does that say to you as a public servant? Now the world is faced with an unprecedented health, economic, and social crisis uh, triggered by the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, mm -hmm. Our world has been upended and yes it is a first and foremost a, a health crisis but you know dealing with this crisis also cre has created and is creating major social and economic disruptions it's exacerbating existing vulnerabilities and inequalities mm -hmm. but we do now know from china's experience that it is a multi-dimensional crisis, but the way to get out of it is to first of all deal with the health crisis, the health component. Once up front, up front, efficiently. Yeah. Mm. So once you are able to put in place the public health measures, mm. the type that China has done so successfully, and you contain the epidemic, the outbreak, mm -hmm in your country, in your community, then you can very slowly uh, you know, build, build back out of it better. You can begin to, in a phased manner, mm. begin to restore normalcy to, to, your, to your economy, to production, to social life, and then you can begin to talk about post-recovery measures. But while doing that, you know, you have to, so the first point is, you know, containment, control, containment and control of the outbreak is part and parcel of getting your economy back to speed and restoring normalcy. The world was caught completely unprepared. And, you know, it also shows you that the health, the educational, the relations, the way we treat men and women, boys and girls, the economic, the environment, they are all interrelated. Absolutely. I think what COVID has shown is the need for and the case for really seriously, every country seriously pursuing sustainable development. How come we only realize this, or most of us only realize this when there's rainy days? There is always, the, you know, the Chinese say, 
you know, every crisis represents an opportunity. So in a sense, this could be a blessing in disguise. So we, you know, we are saying, as we seek to come out of this crisis, and as we can see from the case of China, you know, countries would eventually come out of this crisis. The world will come out of this crisis. But we must not go back to doing the kinds of things, you know, maintaining the systems, the same systems and processes that got us here in the first place. We must build back better, as we say in the UN. We must address all those vulnerabilities, all those systemic deficits that led us here. Uh, it's a situation where a, 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 a virus that is not even that uh, uh, potent can completely disrupt the world like this just shows that we have not been prioritizing the right things. What kind of call would you share with us right now for people to realize how important it is to work together? We see a very shattered world, a very divided and rhetorical world these days, unprecedented to me at least, uh, even. So Dr. Alhomsi, your message? You know, I think, uh, you know, my message is a very straightforward one. Um, the world is so interconnected that, you know, and one of the things that COVID-19 has shown us is that we, we are only as strong as the, weak, the weakest link in the chain. And I like that. If you want to look at the world, I, some, a great uh, public servant in Singapore used an, an analogy of a boat, okay? Uh, if you look at the world system or the United Nations system, uh, you say, okay, there are 193 member states that make up the United Nations. I think the way this 193 member states, this is the way the Singaporean uh, leader put it, professor put it, this 193 member states, are not 193 separate boats. They are actually uh, 193, uh, what do you call them, cabins within this big boat. Now, if there is a fire outbreak in any part of the, of the boat, will you remain in your cabin and say, it's not my problem? What is going to happen is we all have to run out of our individual cabins and try and do what? Put, put out fire. Yeah. Put off the yeah. put out the fire. Yeah. Are we going to be asking the question, who started the fire? What is it that you did that uh, led to this fire outbreak? Our first priority will be to put out the fire. Because if we don't put out the fire, the entire boat will be born and it will, uh, will, will go up in flames and will, will all sink, will all drown and die. That is the way the world is today. And, and that is really the essence of sustainable development. And in order to achieve sustainable development, you need global solidarity. You need international cooperation because many of these problems, you know, are not problems that you can contain within national boundaries. How come, sir, such a clear logic in such a wonderful um, example you just presented. Hard to understand. How come politicians with their national borders because are still thinking so different from what you just explained? It's such a simple logic, isn't it? You know, it's, it's very difficult to, to analyze these sort of issues. Uh, at the end of the day, in, in general, you know, Decision makers, especially of the political type, tend to think in terms of the short term. Sometimes the horizon is not more than four years. The issues we are talking about are long term mega trends, mega issues that you can only address over, the, over several years, decades, with sustained action. But, then and, but the only way you can do that is to take, you know, one, you take a long term view. And you keep, I always say, you keep your eyes on the prize. The prize is a, a more prosperous, a more inclusive, a fairer world, and a healthier environment. Because if we destroy the planet and we don't have an, we, don't, we won't have the economic prosperity that we desire, we won't have the social harmony that we desire. So, you know, 
development is a long-term process. It's actually a process. I, I sometimes say, and this again is not original to me, you know, in terms of sustainable development, if your frame of reference is sustainable development, you can't really call any country developed. All countries are in the journey of sustainable development to ensure the balance, the harmony between the social, the economic, and the environmental. Every country is in, is, is in a process. Of course, you can divide up countries in terms of low-income countries, uh, middle-income countries, high-income countries. I can, you know, that can make sense. But in terms of development, a, a process in which we are all getting better and inequalities are reducing and opportunities are, are being evenly spread. That is a long-term journey. You grew up in Nigeria. Yes. yes. Very poor when you were little. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And politics, very complicated. Very, country. very difficult. Not oriented to serving the well-being of the people. Yeah. Then you went to the UK yeah. to study. Came back as an academic on a university campus with the, almost the very first laptop on campus. Yep. <laughs> Proud of who you are, while at the same time extremely hardworking. And then move on to public service, working for international organizations, and now eventually at the UN six years ago. You talk about the long term, looking at the short term with long term. Tell me how it could happen when it happened to you? You know, my, my personal life il illustrates the one, the, the, the value of having a long term, uh, not just the value, but, but you know, the, 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 the rationality of it all that you have to look. You know, everything you do now is part of contributing to a longer term outcome, you know. And I've seen it in my own life and in the lives of nations and countries where I've worked that, you know, the things you do now are very important for what will happen, basically shape what will happen later. And when you look at, when I come to, and my life in China over the last three years, almost three years and eight months, also illustrates that. Tell me more about when you, I mean, you look at the story of China in 40 years. I tell people I've learned three things from being in China. The first is the power of, of, of long-term thinking, having a plan, okay? And then diligently, what I call sustained disciplined implementation of the plan. That is what has got China to where it is today. It's a large part of the success story, okay? The, 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 the second uh, uh, element of what I've learned in China is the fact that the system has an element of accountability for results built within it at different levels. So it's not enough to have a plan and to be hard working about implementing the plan, but you also track results at every level. And people's career, the way they are seen, whether they are successful or not, depends on what they have contributed to the outcomes, the results. So performance based management of a system, you know, so you track results. Uh, that is also very, very, that's one of the I've learned. The third thing I've learned about China, uh, from living and working in China, is that, you know, you have to build, you have to capacitate society. You know, you have to put in place the enablers of development, so infrastructure. You know, so, you know the sustained investment in infrastructure. When you look at some of the infrastructure that China has, in transportation, in energy, world class. In fact, better in, in many instances than that of some high income countries. Look at the, the, the high speed rail network of China. Look at the, the ICT backbone of China. I mean, the digital economy. I mean, China is basically like the headquarter, the, I would say, the, the, the hub for e commerce, you know, increasingly. I mean, look at what China has done with just investing in infrastructure. The other enabler is the investment in human capital. It's not enough to have good roads and to have ports sorted out, 
have energy sorted out, have telecommunications and so on sorted out. You also have to have the human capital to take advantage of, of that. So those three elements, but those are the results of policies, having the right combination of social, economic and political policies and then implementing them. I am a beneficiary of policies. I was born into a very poor family. In fact, my father was going to school at the same time that we, his children, were going to school. Now, but who, I was born in a part of Nigeria where the government chose to implement free education Lucky at you. primary and second, to some extent, secondary level, as well as free health care. So my mom had seven of us. None died. Because there was free health care. Immunization was free. We had health visitors that came and, and, and checked on your health as a baby. In those days, they weighed the baby. Also, you know, I still have my health card that my dad kept for me. So, you know, policy. So that's, you know, education was what made it possible for me to be here today. So I've seen it in my, I've seen it in my own life. I've seen it in countries that have invested heavily in women's education, girls' education. Policies make huge, huge difference. difference. And then you see, if you, if you equalize educational opportunities for boys and girls, the way China has done, and we have seen it in other, in other countries, Malaysia and so on, you will find that 10, 15 years later, you reap huge benefits, dividend, what we call dividend, education dividend. And you can see it in China, the, the female labor force participation rate is, is quite is above the average for upper middle income countries because in this country there is no gender disparity in access to and participation in education at every level there are very few countries like that but do you think we are walking back with our progress in other words are we still progressing or are we setting back if you look at the headlines of news these days uh, People also ask that question, whether our world goes in cycles, you know, progressive cycles, or cycles of progress and cycles of setback. The, the complex nature of human evolution is that there will be periods of adjustments of crisis that we have to respond to. And, that in, and in coming out of, and that is the sort of perspective the UN Secretary General has taken, that in coming out of this crisis, we come out better, stronger, more, more, more cooperative, uh, more, more driven by integrated uh, perspectives. So I think, you know, there will be cycles, there are always cycles, but the overall, the underlying trend, the overall trend is still going in the direction of progress. I do believe that uh, the world would eventually, you know, I mean, uh, come out of COVID. The thing is we have to come out better. We, we must not, you know, the so-called next normal or new normal, and not and should not be a continuation of the things we used to do in the past. Mm. We should not be in a situation where the work that a woman does. Common sense, once again. And you find that, as I was saying, 70 to 90 percent of the health workers are women. How many of them are in decision making position within the health sector? I'm not saying outside of the health sector, even within the health system. 70 to 90, in some countries, 90 percent, around 70 percent of workers in the health system are women, and less than 30 percent of them are in decision-making positions. No, no society is sustainable with those kind of inequities and inequalities, and that is why we have not coped well with, uh, with, with COVID-19. Why will you strip your health system of the capacity to detect the virus and to be able to respond? Okay, to be able to respond, and yet when things uh, become routine, routinized, and we sometimes forget these fundamentals. What COVID-19 has done to us is to go back to and focus on the fundamentals. Ultimately, uh, as, as I keep saying, you know, your your well-being and my well-being are interconnected. You know, at the level of individuals, so it is at the level of uh, of nations and communities. And I've said I've seen it in my own life. You know, progress for me is a cumulative process. It's a cumulative process. I don't the the progress that really sustains is progress that builds on previous progress. Right. And then 
it becomes much more difficult to reverse them. But if you come and try to shake up the system and, and you, see, you want to create a revolution, and uh, it's not sustainable because you're not building it on something. You have to build how you go forward on the basis of what you are doing right now. Dr. Babatunde Ahongzi, who is the resident coordinator of the United Nations in China.